The British press has been full of articles mourning the coming end of the so-called special relationship between the U.S. and Britain. Well, we should say that for patriots of the United States, such a special relationship has never existed. Attempts to forge a partnership between the United States and our nation's historic enemy, the British Empire, can only be considered an act of treason, and anybody who professes to honor it or believe in it should be branded a traitor. The United States was pulled into World War II when Japanese bombers launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. However, this attack was only a surprise to some. The British had known of such plans to attack the American naval base in Hawaii for over 20 years, for no other reason than that they had been involved in making those plans. December 7th. 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Stretching all the way back to 1902, when the British officially entered a treaty alliance with Japan, ostensibly to curb the growth of Russian power and to protect British imperial interests in China, certain Americans had already begun to recognize that the ultimate target that the British had in mind was the newly united transcontinental United States of America, which had only 40 years before successfully defended itself from another British attack in the form of the Southern Secession. The British, in alliance with an imperially minded Japan, were positioning themselves to stage an attack on the United States from both sides, from the Atlantic and from the Pacific. As the British had worked out with Japan, were war to be launched against the United States, the most ideal first target would be the U.S. naval fleet stationed in the Pacific. In 1920, patriots from among the ranks of the United States Army and Navy began to write contingency plans to deal with such a joint attack, which they dubbed War Plan Orange and War Plan Red. War Plan Red approved as official military policy in 1930 by both the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy, spelled out in detail how a war would be fought by the United States against the entire British Empire. The first phase of such a war would be a land war offensive into the British Dominion of Canada, ultimately followed by a naval invasion of Great Britain across the Atlantic using the coast of Ireland as a base of operations. The war plans were mapped out in detail, from an initial strike against the major British naval base in Nova Scotia to cut off maritime communication between Canada and Great Britain, to seizing the Canadian power plants at Niagara Falls and the strategic mineral reserves in Ontario, accompanied by an invasion of Montreal and Quebec City through Vermont and upstate New York, and of Winnipeg, a major rail hub through North Dakota. Finally, the Navy would blockade Canada's Pacific coast and seize the Great Lakes, and thus the Canadian industrial center around Toronto. Airstrikes against British targets in Canada from secret bases on the Alaska border were also included, as were naval operations to capture the British territories in the Caribbean and to defend the Panama Canal, Alaska, the Philippines, and Hawaii. The most important strategic advantage which the military planners cited for the United States in the event of such a war was that the American people harbored an anti-British tradition, such that the U.S. government would have little difficulty in mobilizing public sentiment in favor of a vigorous prosecution of the war once hostilities began. The ultimate objective was the economic exhaustion of the British Empire. This War Plan Red was officially on the books as active U.S. military policy all the way up until 1939, when the Second World War broke out in Europe. To wage a war against the emergency, as great 
as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Franklin Roosevelt had already been waging a war of his own inside the United States against the agents of that very empire, the so-called enemies within, concentrated in the British protectorate of Lower Manhattan's Wall Street banking houses. Yes, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. He came into office vowing to crush the economic royalists and finally kick out the Tories who all should have left in 1776. And while Roosevelt's domestic policy brought the speculators to their knees, war plan read as a foreign policy was still on the books. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. <laughs> Why did the British insist on appeasing Adolf Hitler? Well, the British had funded Hitler's rise to power, intending to use him, just as they had used Japan, to engage in conflict with and wear down Russia, whose adoption of American system economic policies following 1876 had turned it into the leading strategic threat to the empire's power on the Eurasian continent. However, when Hitler turned west, invading and occupying France, and then turning on the British Isles themselves, the empire had to recalculate their strategy suddenly, lest their own monster wipe them out. On their knees, Britain crawled to the United States, their avowed enemy, to beg assistance. Roosevelt knew that were the British Isles to fall into the hands of the Nazis, there would be nothing standing between a full-scale occupation of the United States from both sides by a German-Japanese axis. He therefore organized a wartime alliance between three leading powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain. In Tehran, in Iran, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin outlined the steps to victory over Germany. However, FDR openly declared that his intention was to end the war as quickly as possible and then proceed with the business of eradicating the influence of the empire and of imperialism from the planet as a whole. Through the whole war, Winston Churchill played an ongoing game, extending the conflict, refusing repeatedly to open a western front, and failing to exploit clear opportunities for quick victory. His strategy was to stall, because he knew that come peacetime, the strong alliance between Roosevelt's United States and Stalin's Russia would spell curtains for the empire. Roosevelt had the plans already in place, piecing together a combination of the United Nations, which he intended to be a community between mutually developing sovereign nation states, and the Bretton Woods, whose fixed exchange rate would protect those long-term development agreements from the speculation and usury of the London-based monetarist empire. However, on April 12, 1945, President Roosevelt, exhausted from three full terms as president of a beleaguered United States, suffered a massive brain hemorrhage and died. Winston Churchill, who had fought an unceasing battle to avoid a cross-channel invasion into Europe from the spring of 1942 until the winter of 1943-44, who had constantly struggled to force a change in Allied strategy so that our troops would be called on to penetrate the mountain barriers which he called with a straight face the soft underbelly of Europe, <laughs> 
made his speech at Fulton, Missouri, in which he directed a savage onslaught against the Soviets. He had tried to shift the weight of the offensive so as to protect British Empire interests in the Balkans and Central Europe against his Soviet ally and to the jeopardy of swift victory. Now he was busy running up a trial balloon for outright war against his former ally. Nor could he have been unaware at the time he suggested an Anglo-American military alliance that the combined chiefs of staff were still meeting regularly in Washington long months after the end of the war. With the patriotic leadership of Roosevelt gone, Harry S. Truman immediately set about relinquishing America's role as a sovereign nation and instead betrayed everything which Roosevelt had fought for, committing the United States to a special relationship with the British Empire, a special relationship which Churchill spelled out in all its imperial detail during his infamous speech in Fulton, Missouri, on March 5, 1946. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English-speaking peoples. A special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States. Fraternal association requires not only the growing friendship and mutual understanding between our two vast but kindred systems of society, but the continuance of the intimate relationship between our military advisors. It should carry with it the continuance of the present facilities for mutual security by the joint use of all naval and air force bases in the possession of either country all over the world. Churchill's intention, with Truman's full support, was to set the United States on the pathway towards a third world war, one whose intended victims would be the two rivals themselves, the Americans and the Russians, each destroying one another. The same old 19th century British geopolitical strategy which had been merely put on pause during Roosevelt's terms in office. Harry Truman and every other president who has sought to cultivate such a special relationship with our historic enemy, the British Empire, should be recognized for what they are, traitors to the United States and a disgrace to every patriot who has fought and sacrificed for the vision of a world freed from this ancient evil of imperialism. Therefore, it should be made known to those among the Queen's most loyal subjects. The anti-British sentiment among the people of the United States is not something new. This is not somehow a creation of some recent event or another. The British petroleum oil spill, the endless opium war in Afghanistan, Barack Obama's continuing bailout of the British banks on Wall Street. All of these egregious acts of treason and war have merely triggered an already existing mood in the American population, which is long-standing and deeply rooted. When the American people recognize that they are struggling for their nation's very survival, in the face of a long-standing enemy which has worked for centuries to subvert and destroy our republic, they will stop at nothing to protect what they hold dear and to finally destroy that imperial enemy of civilization once and for all. Now, therefore, the, the United States has a special responsibility to the world at large at this time of crisis. The fact that in this period, in the recent weeks, we've had 78% of the conscious adult population of the United States has been committed to a return to a Glass-Steagall reform. The enemy is now, first of all, Wall Street. And the second enemy, which has just been mobilized, is Britain because of what the British did, British Petroleum did in the Caribbean. What the British did, are doing, and what the President of the United States is doing in support of them, is not only treasonous in character, but it is enraged people. 
So it is not ordinary political action of the ordinary usual type that is determining this process. It's a much more powerful force. It's the force of culture, a hist history of culture, which mobilizes the people within themselves to do something they otherwise don't think they're capable of doing. You must bring into play a sense of the people mobilizing for a credible goal which binds them together in a sense of what they're doing that they, is such that they will need not be ashamed of what they're doing in the eyes of their grandchildren.